So today's session is about all things equality, diversity and allyship. So consider these questions. How can we be a change for others? How can we encourage greater allyship from white privileged men? And what can we do to influence the mission of positive discrimination? Well, today I am joined by Richard Pickard and Richard is the CEO of Inclusive Search. He's also a strong advocate for equality, diversity and inclusion. He champions the achievement and excellence of female trailblazers and black women in tech. And something that he says, which I will quote for you, is this. I wanted to create a business that had a clear purpose and vision to reach out to a broader talent pool of diverse candidates. So in 2018, I launched my own firm, Inclusive Search. Equality is important to me. Businesses with diversity have a greater balance of voices that help them to create diversity of thought and come up with better and more innovative solutions. So I'm going to bring on Richard now. Hi, Richard. How Hello. are you doing today? I'm really well. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's great to have you here. So thanks for taking some time out to join me. So I'd like to kick off with um, asking you to, to share a bit of your story of why you do what you do now and, and the passion behind that. Sure, well, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I was born um, in a small town just outside Leeds in Yorkshire, and I've got a little bit of a broken home heartbreak story. I went through a bit of a tough childhood. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. My mum suffered with severe depression. And so um, when I was 16, I ended up leaving school. Um, I worked down a coal mine. Um, I got to 21 and I thought there's got to be more to life than this. And so I jumped in an old car that I had and I literally drove to London. Um, I had no education, no useful skills to speak of. Um, and the first job that I actually found was in commission only sales. So if I didn't sell, I didn't get paid. Um, I was pretty terrified and I'd never sold a thing before in my life. So I thought I'll give this a go. Um, and it turned out I was actually pretty good at it. Um, I stayed there for 10 years and then I moved across into recruitment. Um, in recruitment, I did pretty well. I joined some really good companies. I've worked for four international recruitment companies. And for the last 10 years, um, I've either been a director or a CEO. But I think the truth is, uh, when a recruitment company gets to a certain size, um, it can't truly be mission driven anymore. Really, with a lot of mouths to feed, profit has to override absolutely everything. And about five or six years ago, I became a really, really strong advocate, started off with gender, and then um, the, over the last couple of years, that really has expanded into both gender and ethnicity now. And so I'm quite passionate about that mission of companies having more balanced uh, senior leadership and management teams. And I decided three years ago, the only way that I could really achieve that was going to be by starting my own firm. So as you said in the intro, three years ago, I started Inclusive Search. Um, the idea was that I was only going to work with companies who were absolutely committed to taking a look at their decision making staff. I, I wasn't interested in anybody who's padding the numbers by saying, yeah, we've got this percentage of women, but it turns out that all of the women that they hire are in fairly junior roles. I wanted companies yeah. that were determined to have more women on their board more women in senior director roles, PL responsibility, senior strategic decision making responsibility. So if you're a company that were passionate about having more women and a more ethnically balanced leadership team, then I decided that I would um, represent specifically those types of candidates um, and hopefully in the small way that I can um, make, make an impact in, in shaping those companies for the future. Incredible. I love that. I, yeah, I mean, I think as well, you know, coming from the background that you have to then take a stand and say, right, this is what I'm about and this is what I'm going to create is, is a phenomenal thing to do. So I'd love to hear, you know, how have you found that? Like in terms of, you know, are there a lot of companies that are open to that, that are buying into to your mission, your vision of this? 
Yeah, I, th I, th I think the honest truth is everybody, every, everybody kind of wants to do the right thing. I mean, it's it's 2021, right? So I think most people kind of understand it's the right thing to do. I think now there's also a lot of data out there that shows executives that uh, the more diverse and more balanced your company is, probably the more commercially successful you're going to be as well. I think that data is in now. And so everybody kind of wants to do the right thing. The difference is, is your company actually being intentional about doing something about it? And so, look, for me, it's a little bit like um, shifting an oil tanker with um, some of the really big global companies. Um, it's it's debatable um, how much success they're having. Um, uh, Again, not singling anybody out. I think it's simply just the sheer scale of some of these organizations. It's really, really difficult to, to move them. Um, so what I tend to find is a lot of quite entrepreneurial tech companies, and that can be right from startup, but it also can be people that have already gone through two, three fundraisings and they've already got a thousand staff and you know th these kind of hyper growth companies as well. Maybe to a certain extent, it's a little bit generational as well. A lot of these companies have been led by people that are in their 30s. And I think, therefore, they've probably got a slightly more progressive, open mind around some of these issues. Um, there's not so much of that kind of old boys club. Um, you know, mm. it, it is all different types. But I think, I think small, agile, um, and medium-sized um, entrepreneurial being um, especially driven by, um, let's say, leaders under 50. Um, and I say that not in an ageist way, I'm a guy who's 51. Um, but I think that probably is the typical profile of companies that are having a lot of success in this space. But again, the main thing that is different is that from the executive level, they have decided that they want to be intentional. They have decided we're going to stamp a, a flag in the ground and say, you know, we want to um, we want to have a balanced team. We believe that that is our strength. Embracing each other's different perspectives, we think that makes us stronger. We think it's integral to the product that we're going to produce. And so, anything less than balanced leadership teams is just not acceptable. It's that intentionality I think that makes the difference. And it's great to hear that that is happening. Um, and as you say, it, it's, I, I, and I can understand that it's probably in more of the entrepreneurial style companies or the, the people that are more, I guess, open to this. And you've got some of the bigger companies. Where, where do you find the challenges in the bigger companies? Is it more the culture of the organization or is it individuals, with it, depending on who you're dealing with? So for example, could you be speaking to a company and making headway because of a particular person you're talking to but actually in other aspects you're not because of the broader culture um of, of that organization i think you've got two problems i think there's a recruitment problem and then i think there's um, an inclusion lived experience problem and probably the, the problem that i solve is not the biggest problem i think inclusion is actually a way bigger problem um so you you can make some diverse hires but then the real issue is what what's the quality of life for that diverse hire when they get in those organizations. And that probably is even just quality of life on the soft side, just living with the usual kind of microaggression type stuff that a lot of people are doing quite unconsciously um, mm -hmm. without even looking at things like, you know, what is the structure around how is somebody trained and developed? How is somebody appraised? Uh, how is somebody sponsored? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things and not even touching on things like pay gaps and all of that. I just think the lived experience, um, like I say, we're, we're still quite new just at the idea of can we make some more diverse hiring decisions, please? Well, mm -hmm. that, that we are a long way away from those people having an equal and fair experience once they get in the door. Um, I think you know. I think I think there's, there's a lot of people in these organisations, and especially in the larger organisations, there's a lot of people who want to do the right thing. But I think ultimately, you know, you you need somebody on the exec team who's going to own it. It's that planting a flag and being intentional, and somebody who on that exec team is going to bring it up in board meetings every single month and say, so show me the data. What are we doing better this month than we did last month? You know, and then kicking that down to their leaders. You know, I mean, if you wanted to be really, really brave, 
what you have to do is you have to link this sort of stuff to their promotion prospects and even i mean crazy brave would be linked it to their bonus um you just turn around and say to your mds it is unacceptable for you to not be leading and developing balanced teams you know it's fundamental to our success as a business i don't want white male teams um so you need to take that feed it down to your reports and people can't get promoted unless they've got this demonstrable track record of hiring diverse talent nurturing that talent that talent being retained because they're enjoying the experience and also those people then gaining promotions as well so you know if 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 that kind of of passion for this was was done in the large organizations incrementally things would change and maybe in 2 3 4 years time it would be different um it's just simply easier to do that if your business is 200 people or if your business is 1000 people versus if your business is 50000 people and spread across you know 50 different countries it it's just difficult to control that and and to really impact that change in large organizations yeah yeah and i think a couple of things you've touched on there as well um number 1 is the inclusion part so even so i guess part of my que- my next question is about um tick box exercise so do you come across companies who are doing it from a point of view to be seen to be saying they're doing the right thing but actually are not really putting the emphasis on the inclusion aspect or also what you mentioned about the the levels of which people are coming in at so are they coming in purely or they're just a hiring diversely for the junior roles versus okay we're looking at managers at leaders execs and being more broad about the approach what are you finding yeah. at the moment i'm aware of both happening um but i'll be honest lila i i tend not to work with those companies um yeah. i mean tokenistic hiring um it's it's a bit of a double edged sword isn't it because i mean i suppose at least that there is an element of the first one is coming through the door there always has to be a first um it 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 obviously is is really disappointing that somebody is getting hired specifically because they are a black woman and we wanted a black woman in this job so that we can show the world i mean that that obviously is disappointing um but then again by the same token that the first black woman has got in the door the the question then becomes what kind of experience does that woman have in that mm. that environment um you know for me like i say i think it's just easier to do these things as a smaller and more medium sized company um you know i think there's there's a, there's an awful lot of problems in the inclusion piece um I, i think leaders just need to you know they need to educate themselves um they need to listen more they need to learn from the 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 experience that employees are having so they've got to think of forums and you know whether that is sort of 360 mentoring or you know anonymous feedback or uh, exit interviews for everybody or you know whatever it might be um you know i mean fundamentally my day job is that i headhunt people from companies to move them to other companies and right. what i find very very easy is approaching diverse talent in certain industries and taking them out of that industry and moving them into a more progressive type of company the unfortunate right. thing is that's just too easy um there's an awful lot of um of women and women of color in the larger organizations that when i speak to them um maybe if, I, if they're not in my network if i'm speaking to them for the first time by the time we're 20 minutes into a conversation they're actually starting to reveal all the microaggressions all the things that frustrate them about getting passed over how they're not getting developed in the same way uh, sometimes they're not even in the same room as as white male peers um you know the 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 interruptions the you know the comments that are made the kind of theft of ideas some again i'm generalizing to make the point but um yeah. it's uh it's it, it's a different lived experience for a lot of um a lot of candidates that are from underrepresented groups yeah yeah and so tell me what what can we do to educate ourselves then on, on how to be the change for others what what is it that you you seeing out there that we can do well i think the first thing i i mean i the, the best example i can give is how i started um 
And so the thing that got me really passionate about this, so I, I was moved to do this because my daughter was getting into her mid-teens. Um, I think dads with daughters is a very key way to engage men in the allyship mission. Um, now, there's some interesting stats around that, if you think about it, though. Um, I think approximately 60% um, of men in the UK have kids and 51% of the population is female. So it suggests there's quite a lot of dads with daughters out there. The problem is that the average age to have your first kid is when you're 33 and you probably don't really start thinking seriously about, my goodness, my daughter is gonna face all of these gender hurdles in her career. You probably start thinking about that roughly when I did, which was when my daughter was sort of mid high school, coming to me for careers advice, and we were starting to think about, well, what's she gonna do? And then I suddenly woke up when she was 13, 14, and thought, my goodness, wouldn't it be a terrible world if she didn't have the same opportunities as a white man would? And so I got, but the problem is for most men then, they're gonna be in their mid forties and I was um, by the time they start thinking about this stuff seriously. So I guess what we need to try and do is maybe get them um, passionate about this just a little bit earlier in life. And so dads with daughters, I'd love that to kind of uh, expand out to kind of men with sisters, um, you know, men with girlfriends, men with wives. I think men have got to, you know, you know they've, they've, they've got to find a way that they realize that these kind of issues personally impact them and their loved ones. And if they can just make that connection, and then the next step is education. And what I did was I joined the 30% Club. Um, now, the 30% Club, if you're not aware of it, go onto the website, check it out. Um, they have um, a, a research and articles tab. And it is literally a treasure trove of reading material. They've got all of the own reports that 30% clubs put together, but they've also got a whole library um, of third party reports. And especially uh, people like McKinsey are putting out phenomenal work. Um, and all of that is on the 30% club. So you can get access to just one click on their website. You can get access to report after report after report. And you start reading that stuff and most important, start thinking a bit more deeply about the issues that are being discussed and maybe try to make that connection between how these issues maybe manifest themselves in your own reality, may, maybe in your own workplace or maybe amongst your own family or your own friends. You've got to try and make that allyship, I think, you've got to try and find your own reason for doing it. So you've got to make that mental connection between there are women that I care about in my family, and this is actually, the data says, their, their lived experience. Now, the other thing that you can do on the 30% Club website is um, they split their geographies into what they call club chapters. So you can go to your own country and then click on steering committee, and it will give you um, the ladies who are leading the 30% club in that country. So if you do it for the UK, it automatically gives you the names of about 25 of the most passionate advocates in the gender equality space that you could ever want to know. So you can follow them on social media, follow them on LinkedIn, see what they're talking about, start to get involved in that conversation, and you could reach out to them. They're incredibly generous with their time. Um, you know, when I started doing this, I literally just reached out to somebody on the 30% Club Steering Committee. We had breakfast together. She educated me on a lot of stuff and said, look, what you do as a white middle-aged man is actually really important to the mission because what we do is we are passionate women getting a group of passionate women together telling them how great women are now that's fantastic and it's got its place but kind of we're preaching to the converted so what we actually need is a lot of white middle-aged men that are maybe collecting together other white middle-aged men and challenging them to get educated and to start getting involved in this conversation as well and so you can reach out to these um, these women. Um, they will meet with you. They will give you good advice. They will come and help at events. They'll speak. I hosted 
uh, business breakfasts for white male leaders for about the next two or three years. And I did it every couple of months. And every time I would just get a phenomenal speaker from the 30% club who would come along and just blow their mind with all of the data. But then beyond the data would turn around and say, so what are you doing in your organizations? You know, you rolled out some unconscious bias training three years ago and you ticked the box. But what, what is actually working and how are you measuring it and how are you returning to it? And, and how is it actually manifesting itself in changing and creating more balanced teams? So um, I, would, I would say start small um, and, and nothing more than a really great source of loads and loads of well-written reports and then an instant group of women that you can follow and when you feel inclined to engage with and then, you know, start to look at things, you know, whatever your best method of learning is, you know, some people would prefer to look at this stuff on YouTube, or some people would prefer to listen to podcasts, or, you know, some people might um, prefer to attend meetups or even start going to the, the women in type events. Um, there's so much out there now, and especially coming out of COVID, you know, I think we learned last year that we can put a lot of this stuff virtually. And I mean, there's just such a resource for especially free content as well. Just so much stuff that you can get access to and you don't even have to leave the house anymore to network and to get involved in this mission. Yeah, gosh, there, there's a lot out there, isn't there? So, it, you know, I think it's, it's, what I'm hearing is we don't really have any excuses because <laughs> the information, the data is out there, the resources are out there, the people are out there. It, it's about making that decision to actually want to, to educate ourselves, want to learn more to then take action and to reach out. Absolutely. Yeah. And how can we, so we talked about educating ourselves. How about encouraging greater allyship? How do you approach that? Is that, for example, the, the, the breakfast meetings you mentioned where you get someone to come and actually share the reality of what's going on? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, like I say, I think I think the honest truth is, um, you know, with most of this stuff, it's it, it's it's one person at a time. You know, it's kind of how do you eat an elephant? Um, it's such a big mission. But if you're not careful, you can start slipping into the idea of it's such a big mission that it's impossible. So let's just forget about it. I think we just have to accept that whilst we would love lots of change today, um, the honest truth is one person at a time, um, you know, it will eventually um, make an impact. Um, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the, the way that I approach this um, is, is just very much from a view of, I think there is, there is a problem around privilege in that those of us that have it are kind of terrified of giving some of it to other people. And you kind of want to retain your stranglehold on power, even if sometimes that's totally subconscious. It's it's when you have privilege, you often, uh, you know, the plights of those that don't have it, it's just completely lost on you. A lot of yours is quite unconscious. You're, you know, you're, you're benefiting because you've got, you know, sort of certain dimensions to your identity that you didn't ask for. Um, but, you know, advantages that are out of your control but in society, they often do represent quite an imbalance of power. Um, and so, you know, I, I think about white privilege. Um, I don't think of it as being some kind of uh, pie in the sky idealism that all white people are enjoying nirvana. Um, but, you know, it does mean that maybe society is shaped in a way that, um, that, that racism is actually invisible to an awful lot of white people. Um, you know, for example, nobody in my life has ever sat me down um, and had a conversation with me about race. Um, you, you know, I, I think when I refer to I'm British, what I probably think in my own mind is that British is my version of British. So, you know, as a, as a white, male, able-bodied, straight guy, I kind of think of that as British, default British, and everybody else who's not that is kind of other British. So, you know, I think, um, you know, the more you deviate from the norm, um, you know, the more challenges you, you face as you try to navigate either work or, or even to a certain extent, even society. 
Mm. Yeah, and I, I, I think, I guess now it's being talked about a lot more, but prior to that, it was almost things were just taken for granted or weren't, as you say, they weren't even in our, in our, in our conscious awareness at all that we have certain privileges over others. It's just, that's just how it is. And then you hadn't really looked at it and, and sort of brought it into your reality and thought, actually, well, this is why this happens for me, but other people might struggle. Mm. Um, so I think that's really, really important. So you said earlier that you, you, you work with clients who are committed to the, to the mission of positive discrimination. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think positive discrimination is quite, it's probably um, a, a bit of an ugly way to say it um, in that I think most people would, would have a negative connotation to that. And I don't, I don't see this as being negative at all. Um, you, you know, I, um, I work with clients who are prepared to look at their uh, mid-senior management teams, ask themselves whether they're balanced, and if they're not, are simply prepared to do something about it. It's, it's no more complicated than that. Um, I believe that nowadays, pretty much every organization has analyzed its gender and ethnicity mix, so it actually knows the data. Um, the question is just simply, are they prepared to do anything to change it? Um, and some companies, they've decided that they're going to be really intentional about this. Um, they, they've made an executive decision that their organization will be commercially stronger as a balanced company. Uh, and now they're executing a strategy to try and make that happen. So it starts to a certain extent with reimagining your recruitment practice. Um, so you, you look at, for example, who do you engage with on the recruitment side and how do you engage with them? I mean, as a recruiter, it, it's, it's harder to present a shortlist that's made up of highly suitable candidates from underrepresented groups. There's, there's no question, it, 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 it's harder, but it's not impossible. It just takes more work and more time. And so the, the question becomes, as a company, are you working with suppliers who either have the skills to do that or are prepared to do that? Are they passionate about that mission? So you can do that in all sorts of different carrot and stick ways. Um, you, you can put some, you know, some sort of um, uh, service level agreements in place that mean our shortlists need to comprise of this many of this. And that you could argue might be an element of positive discrimination. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, as an organization that's intentional, what they're really saying is, when we cast our net around the market, we actually want the shortlist to be more representative of what the real world looks like. Um, you know, the, the honest truth is that so many, so many people get around this by saying, we don't discriminate because we always want to just hire the best candidate for the job. Now that is an absolute cop out. 95% of the historical talent pool is white and male in almost every single um, you know, specialty that you could think of. Um, you, know, you look at tech, um, you know, I, do a, I do a series on LinkedIn called Exceptional Female Role Models where I interview especially uh, just incredible black women that work in the tech space. I've lost count of the number of interviews that I've done where those women have said, I am one of three black women working in a function of 500 people. Um, so the, the idea that we don't discriminate, we just always want to hire the best person for the job. Well, if that's your mantra, if that's what you're being intentional about, you're probably gonna keep on hiring white men because in almost every single talent pool, there will be more white men than there will any other um, uh, uh, community. Um, so for me, um, I am more interested in companies that are saying, well, maybe if we hire a smart, enthusiastic, creative candidate from an underrepresented group who's only got maybe 85% of the technical skills required to do the job, but we can figure out a solution to very quickly close that skills gap because to our company's success, having a greater balance of voices, we see that as being our fundamental goal. And, and the positive discrimination bit, I'm not, I'm not trying to disadvantage white men. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely fair that whatever the, the, the ratio of society is, you know, it might be that around about 40% of these jobs should still be held by white men. Um, I'd also like to see that 
mix of white men, though, a bit more socioeconomically mixed. Um, I, I don't just want all of those white men to be top tier university public school white men, because again, that's not representative of, of, of real life either. So I think companies should be a bit more intentional, even in looking for a, a, a greater diversity amongst their white male employees. Um, but if we said 40% white men, then that means that 60% should be a mixture of um, you know, black and brown candidates, uh, female candidates, and then also, e even though it's not something that I have the bandwidth to be an advocate for, I'm obviously very passionate about all areas of equality, so that would bring in LGBT candidates, uh, you know, disability, uh, you know, it, it would bring in absolutely everybody from an underrepresented group. I, I am just passionate about companies looking like their customers. That, that fundamentally, and I think in a tech company, um, you know, the idea that, you know, this, this group of um, white straight men are producing product, which actually is going to be used by a very, very much not white male audience anymore, you know, their customer, surely um, you're going to build better and more innovative product if you're, uh, you know, if you're developers um, and if your senior team is more representative of your your customer base. For me, I think it's it. If you can't buy into the it's 2021, and so this is the right thing to do, then mm. buy into it for the product development argument or the innovation argument or just for the commercial argument. We'll probably make more money if if we've got a a, a better balance of voices. But buy into it for one of those arguments instead. Then just be intentional and decide to make the change. Yeah. And, and so, first of all, the question I want to ask as well, when you talk about um, companies being more open to, let's call it diverse recruitment, doing what you do now, how do you find the candidates that you're seeking, as in, I don't mean, how do you look for them? Is it as in, how do you find them in terms of their um, preparedness to put themselves forward let's say for senior roles because I, I've had conversations with people in the past and it was, it was one conversation in particular came to mind as you were saying that where they were struggling in an organization to get the um, the underrepresented groups let's say to actually put themselves forward for promotions or to move up in the business yeah look, I mean there are some um, again we're generalizing but there are some fairly decent data around traits versus, you know, let's say male and female. Um, you know, I think there is an argument that says that when a female looks at a job description, probably feels that she needs to have nine and a half or 10 of the things ticked before she'd go for it. Whereas, you know, you tend to get, especially the more alpha man, um, if he's got five of the things, he'd probably put his hands straight up and say, yep, I'm straight in for that. Again, generalizing to make the point. Um, but I mean, the honest truth of what I find um, is that I think I think female and candidates from underrepresented groups, they can often be a bit over mentored and under sponsored in organizations. So I think nowadays they get quite a lot of mentoring, quite a lot of, um, you know, uh, tips and uh, and tools. Um, but I think there's not necessarily enough people in organizations that are spending their political capital on behind closed doors in the rooms where the conversations that matter are occurring, they are saying, I want to back that woman or I want to back that black and brown candidate. Um, I just I just think there is a little bit of under sponsoring, which is, you know, an awful lot of the senior roles, it tends to be that, that you need that internal sponsor to be shouting on your behalf and you, you might never know that that conversation's taking place, um, but you need somebody championing you to, to get that leg up for a lot of these senior roles. Again, when I go back to my interview series, when I'm interviewing more senior women and I'm saying, what was the, what was the secret to your success? Pretty much every single one of them talks about the role models that they had, the mentors that they had, and the sponsors that took a chance on them and gave them a break. So all of that stuff is is really really important. When it comes to what I do, 
I mean, I'm lucky that I'm now six years into this mission. And so an awful lot of the women that I place into roles, I, I've got quite a, a long-term relationship with them. And so I already know what they can do. I've already um, spent time, you know, having lots of conversations with them. Uh, you know, when I look at a CV and when I look at a profile and when I listen to somebody, you know, I'll give them advice and mentoring myself in, in, I think you absolutely could do this. Um, and I think a lot of this is about honesty and transparency. I'm when I'm presenting opportunities to these women, you know, what I'm trying to say is, look, 80 percent is fine. And I think the 80 percent that you bring is absolutely amazing. Now, we can figure out a way to close the gap for the other 20 percent. And here is how we would do it. So some of this stuff is just me being a half decent facilitator in that I will talk to the client and they'll tell me what they're looking for. And then I will figure out what are the essentials with them and what are the bits that we ha actually have a solution for how we could close a gap. So I'll try and encourage clients to be a little bit more flexible in what they're um, expecting to walk through the door for interview. And then when I go to the candidate side, I'm looking for who ticks the box on the essential component. And I'm trying to encourage um, candidates from all underrepresented groups to put themselves forward and not worry about the bits of the job description that they haven't done before. And actually, I think, take away the whole gender ethnicity piece, surely that's the best job to have anyway. You know, who, who wants to go into a job where you already can do 100% of the things? Um, you know, the only way that we learn is by stepping out of our comfort zone and being faced with challenges that we've never actually. So I actually think coming into a role where you've only got 85% of the skills, I think that's perfect because there's some growth in that for you. Um, Absolutely. It, as yeah. I said, traditional recruitment, uh, a lot of companies, they've got a very fixed idea of what they want to walk through the door. And the unfortunate thing is that an awful lot of the time you've got hiring managers that what they actually want to walk through the door is a mirror image of themselves because they can relate to that and they can figure out immediately as to how I'm going to train and develop you because you're a little bit like I was five years ago. So I get it straight away. Um, and it's just it's it's just more difficult when let's say a black woman walks through the door or a hijabi wearing Muslim woman walks through the door. It's just a little bit more challenging for them. And if you've not got the education piece, and if you've not got somebody who's very senior in the business reminding you, that's exactly what we want because we need a more balanced set of voices in this team. Um, if you believe that, then it's not scary when that walks through the door. It's actually, thank goodness you're here. And then all you need to figure out is the inclusion piece around, this isn't annoying that we're different. We should be celebrating that. Our strength is that we're different. When we sit around the table and we try to solve a problem, now we're gonna have all of these different ideas as to how we solve a problem. You know, I, as I say, for 10 years, I've been a director or a CEO. I have been in far too many board meetings that have been all white and male that literally we didn't need to have those meetings. What we already knew that we were going to agree on everything. I've never heard any virtually any innovation that's been suggested that was like me waking up and thinking, wow, I never expected that. Um, literally, um, we all knew what we were going to agree on. We might as well have not bothered doing the meeting to a large extent. Again, exaggerating to make the point, but um, very, very few surprises. Um, we all kind of thought the same way and we all knew how we thought before we even walked in the room. Now, I think immediately you um, seat half of the people around the table as women. Um, then you start to bring in some people that have got different socioeconomic backgrounds. Then you start to bring in people that have got uh, different cultural backgrounds or different international experience. And now suddenly these people are looking at the same problem, but there's about five or six different approaches as to, well, I think this would be the best solution. And then somebody says, well, yeah, but hold on a second. What about, what about this as a solution? And now suddenly we're brainstorming and we've got all of these really interesting, and, and at the end of it, we probably come up with something that's a bit more robust and probably something that is a bit more suited to our customers who are this mix of all different um, groups and genders and uh, cultural backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. If you look 
about that. It's quite logical. You know, who would who would design a business today and think I don't want to I don't want to make a product for 100 percent of the customer base out there. I actually want to narrow it down to this diminishing group of people that is already less than 50 percent. And that is going to be my target audience. Um, and let's ignore all the rest. It, 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 it doesn't make sense. The, the, the truth with the structure of companies is that historically, um, what they've done is they've structured themselves in a way that their typical employee will thrive. And their typical employee was a white straight man. So that typical employee normally does quite well in most um, legacy structures because that's who that's who was designed for. That is designed. Mm -hmm them to succeed so the more you deviate from the white straight man model then the more problems you're going to have navigating around that organization and thriving in that organization and potentially even just bringing your authentic self to work um, because actually the structure wasn't set up for you hence we go right back to the beginning of the conversation is that if you've got a tech company that was only created two years ago maybe they don't have that kind of baggage maybe they actually were created in a time where um the the the, the, the entrepreneurs leading that business turned around and said well we want to sell our products to a really diverse customer base and we don't want to um block out hiring any fantastic talent so let's build the most diverse company selling to this really diverse customer base mm. it's all logical when you think about it but we are quite hamstrung by legacy and tradition and how to get on in, in especially in the large global corporates. Yeah, yeah. You, you shared a, a ton of information and insights in, in, in what you just talked about there. Um, and I think, so, so one of the things that I, I just pick up on is um, what you said about how, and I, I know it's a generalization, but I know there's also stats to back it up that, that men will tend to, go for a role where they've only got you know, 50 percent of, of the experience whereas women will want to have as much as possible close to 100 and i've always challenged that to say well where is the growth and where it's whether it's companies or recruitment people who are saying well you need you have you can't we can't put you forward or we can't interview you because and not helping the cause because for me a, lot, a career is about growth life is about growth so you want to have you know 15 20 percent of anything you're doing next to be something that is new because we can all learn if we want to learn we can all do it and i think that's really important and the fact that you are um, an advocate for that you're facilitating those conversations and also from what i hear you saying you're almost acting as a mentor in some way for the candidates to to, to be more open to the opportunities that are possible for them which i think is, is so so important right now because it's more people like yourself that we want to have there to, to encourage those people to actually think bigger and think about what's possible. Sure, and don't get me wrong, Lila. I mean, look, so many of the um, the women that I interact with, particularly, I mean, they don't need any mentoring from me. They blow my mind. You know, they're so they're so amazing. That's why I started the exceptional female role models interview series because. I was just having phenomenal conversations with people every week and it was inspiring me. And I was just thinking, hold on a second, you know, especially when we were all locked down and we we're figuring, trying to figure out something to do. Um, I just thought to myself, why don't I share some of these conversations? And so I just approached, you know, a few women and said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, could we could we actually uh, do this as an interview where I'll um, almost phrase it as let's do a letter to your younger self. What would you tell 22 year old you if you had that chance? And so I asked a series of questions and and let the feedback that on linkedin for this um and like i say so many of these women they, they they blow me away they don't need any mentoring what they actually need is a spotlight shining on them so that everybody who thinks that the talent pool is quite shallow um can wake up and realize that there are just some amazing women out there um, and even um, even not 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 all of my interviews are with people that are obviously made it. You know, people that are in their forties and fifties and are already in senior roles. There's an awful lot of of young entrepreneurs that I interview that are mid twenties that have just decided. You know what? I'm not going to wait for society. I'm you know I've got an idea and I've got a laptop. Um, I'm going to start my own business. Um, and some of those ladies 
you know, they've, they've already got successful businesses where they're employing a dozen people and they're 26 and started with a laptop in their bedroom, you know. So yeah, I, I'd like to think that I, I can do um, some mentoring as required and I can help people understand. I think this is a role that you'd be a really serious contender for and I think the client would really value you going for it. Um, I think I can probably help encourage like that. But I'd hate to give the idea that, you know, th these women are waiting for me to give them some tips to be brilliant. Um, it's not the case. They, they blow my mind every day. Yeah. And it's amazing. And I absolutely um, invite anyone watching today or on replay to go check out. I think they're all on your um, personal page on LinkedIn, aren't they? If you go there, you can find yeah, if you, yeah, if you just go into my activity feed and then look under articles, um, all of the uh, all of the exceptional female role model interviews um, are all on my personal page um, under my articles. Um, yeah. and I, you know, I get I get literally dozens, if not hundreds, of emails um, from all over the world from people that feed back to me. I've taken this tip and I've changed this, and that really helped me deal with this. So no, it's a, it's not something I get paid for. It's uh, it's part of the advocacy sort of allyship work that I do. Um, but I I enjoy it massively. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I definitely recommend go have a look. I, I had a look and I was blown away uh, when I started reading them. We just just get like drawn into them all. It, it's fascinating to read. Um, and so tell me, you, you alluded earlier to the benefits of diversity in organisations. There's a lot been written about it. There's a lot of reports. Could you just give me a couple of examples of what you've seen or experienced in terms of what that looks like? Yeah, I mean, there is some data out there that talks about, you know, for example, the uh, the chances of you exceeding your financial targets. Um, I think Deloitte um, put together a report that said that if you've got a more uh, diverse, more balanced um, team, I think it said 75% uh, of those companies um, hit their financial targets. Um, I think Gartner put together a report where it was saying um, it was comparing uh, diverse teams versus very similar companies who uh, had non-diverse teams. And again, um, I think the stats were that it, I think it was in the high 60s or something that they were outperforming non-diverse competitors. Um, so there's, there is bits and pieces of, of data out there that kind of prove the point. Um, but, you know, I think the, the simple fact is, um, and again, I'm in danger of repeating myself a little bit, but it just goes back to you, you know look, look at the look at the logic and the commercial argument. Our customers are more diverse. We should think that way, and especially when it comes to product innovation, we should think that way. And then also look at the uh, if you want to call it the moral argument of surely this is the right thing to do. Uh, why are we why are we resisting this? Why in any way does this seem like an illogical thing to do, which is that we should be giving people um, a fair opportunity to join our organization. They should then be treated fairly when it comes to appraisal and promotion. Um, they should be treated fairly when it comes to pay. Um, what I, I I really struggle to understand why anybody looks at those concepts and thinks that actually that is the illogical view. For, for me, it's 180 degrees the wrong, wrong way around. Um, and, you know, I'm so pleased that now more and more data is out there that is saying if you just structure your company this way, your product will be better and you will be commercially stronger, you'll be more innovative, you'll, you'll benefit in all of these ways by having equal, balanced, fair structures in your organization. And as I say, you know, it's, it's not a tick box exercise at all. It's not about when you do some sort of report that you're required to do, what's your percentage of, because for that to be meaningful in an organization, all of these, all of this uh, balance, it has to be at the senior level. You, you're not going to benefit from that balance if all of that balance is down at the clerical junior level. These people need to be sitting in the room. They need to be around the boardroom uh, table. They need to be uh, running business units. They need to be responsible for strategic decision making and P&L. Um, and so, you, you know, all of that needs to be at the mid to senior uh, management level to right up to the executive level. 
Um, and if you if you're if you're not intentional around creating that kind of balance, then your company doesn't benefit from all of the the stuff that the data is talking about anyway. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Richard, I just want to say thank you so, so much for joining me today. This has been an incredibly insightful conversation. You have shared a wealth of invaluable information and knowledge for everyone listening. Um, I think it's just really opened up my eyes and I'm sure many of the listeners to what we can do, what we can all do to play a part in this, to, to encourage more diversity, more inclusion within the workplace. You're very welcome. And, and like I say, I think my final point would be, you know, I, I'd love to see more men in this mission. Um, you know, I think it I think it's so important um, that, that men are really passionate about this. Um, start small, um, start with some um, educating yourself, start with approaching some people and asking them if they're comfortable having conversations and and do a bit of listening and learning. And also don't be worried about the clumsiness of your language. I think a lot of men, they're a bit terrified of going into this because they know that they probably don't quite know what to say and how to phrase it so that they're really politically correct. And so they think, oh, no, no, I'll stay away from that. It's the opposite. If you're, if you're really transparent and if you say to somebody, I would like to have a conversation about gender or about race or about disability or about LGBT, whatever it is you want to talk about so that you can learn. If you're just brave enough to say, and I apologize in advance, that I am quite ignorant in this space, but I am here to listen and to learn, then everybody will forgive you your clumsy use of language. Just just start small um, and just concentrate on the education piece at the beginning um, and then obviously see where it takes you. Yeah, great advice then. It comes back to what you said at the start about being intentional and being transparent. Um, I think that will go a long way to, to people wanting to then have those conversations and, and, and share and educate. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks, for, again, Richard. thanks for the conversation. Oh, absolute pleasure. It's been great to hear you um, talking and sharing all of this. It really has been. So thank you so, so much. And for those of you watching, whether you're live here today or on the replay, do reach out and connect with Richard and, and check out those interviews that he's talking about because they really are phenomenal. And so before we finish up today, as always, I would just like to remind you until next time, remember to build your influence, make an impact, and be remembered for the right reasons by showing up as the best version of yourself. And if you haven't already done so, do grab your copy of the personal brand playbook. The link is in the comments. And I look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week.